two biggest personalities in the in the league, bro, right here. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here. I got my boy JC with me. JC, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Season one champ. I know he didn't introduce me the way he should have. But. All right, we got we got some egos out here, but you know, today <laughs> we're here for a momentous occasion. The first ever award show voting of the Big Juice League. Now, Xbox. just to give you guys a little rundown of the categories here, we have underrated Pokemon, best duo, best nicknames, most improved coach, defensive and offensive MVP, league-wide MVP, which we'll explain later on, and then last one, coach of the season. So, that out of the way, let's look at the nominees for underrated Pokemon. All right. JC, see on your screen here, we got these five goats right here. Now, you telling me, yeah. obviously, you have Quillfish on here from your team, but tell me about, uh, you can tell I'll me a little Quill. bit about Quillfish, but about the other four as well. How do you think these five matched up against each other this season and how they helped their teams out? Well, all right, so I'm going to be honest here. I think, because Kecleon being your mom, I'm going to take it a little gentle on you. No, you can, definitely... no be, brutally on, be brutally honest. Yeah. Definitely didn't give that Mon as much time in the sun as I think it should have gotten. Bro, oh, hold um, on. While well, you keep explaining, I'm going to pull up Showdown real quick. You, you keep going. Not a lot of time in the sun from a boy Kecklein. He used it as fodder. Don't let him confuse you, man. He used it as fodder. Um, okay. I think Jelson is a huge issue. It was a huge issue, especially for my team. Uh, and we'll see in the playoffs as well. It'll be a huge Kecleon issue, went I'm thirteen sure. and thirteen, by the way, so that was not fodder. One point oh KD. But yeah, keep going. Yeah, uh, thirteen. That's fodder, bro. That's that's fodder, bro. Oh, if it's even, that's fodder. Crowfish is five and seventeen. <laughs> it definitely. Hey, all right. All right keep, wait, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. We're not counting the spike kill. We're not counting the momentous spikes that he laid, bro. We're not counting the intimidations. <laughs> All right, Shinotic, I think, I think honestly, Chris would have had a way worse season if he didn't pick up Shinotic. I think it definitely put a lot of pressure on other coaches on how to play around him because the strike sap is so annoying. I agree because when he, what was it? He dropped Carbink and Ludicolo for Shinotic and Gastrodon. Those two are the backbone of his team. The second he picked them up, he started going crazy. Yeah, having that amount of recovery, bro, and, like, bulkiness and overall type exclusiveness, like, Shinotic only being really weak to poison, and then you have Gastronon having Storm Drain, so it takes away that, like, he can't just spam water moves. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm not a huge fan of Torterra. I, I, I will say. I, I mean, not to slander Tanner here, but I would have to agree. I think uh, Torterra... I th I th okay, let's be honest here. Torterra had a great season, went 30 and 26. It fr has the most, well, second most kills on his team. It was a big part in his team, but I think it took away some of the spotlight from some other Pokemon that could have had more time in the sun, if you get what I'm saying. I definitely, yeah, I definitely think he forced Torterra a little, a little too much. I think he wanted to use it so bad that he, like, had to make it come every week um obviously tanner being top three coach for sure um i just feel like he thought upon himself you know i'm gonna bring this mod everywhere and he did the same thing with it you know what i mean like he did and yeah, that, he that's never, the part he never that's brought the defensive stealth rock so it was always that rock polish with the uh sword stand or like wood hammer or seed bomb earthquake all that stuff right 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 so, so i mean love the mon love torterra and like by itself, I just feel like in terms of it being it being voted for this. Excuse me, by the way, voted Here. for this. I, I think it's, I think it's out of the question. All right. So just looking at these, you can you can say how it is. What do you? Obviously, I'm the only one who knows who actually won these categories. But looking at these, who do you think won? And then besides, who do you think won? Who do you think was like a close second? Well, I guess we already so... know it's a tiebreaker, but. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I'm going to be a little biased here. Having my PU pick really put these the absolute pressure on some of these teams. They were terrified of the Quillfish. i got to go with my boy on this one. 
All right. Now, let's see. The winner of underrated Pokemon of Big Deuce Champions League Season 2 is... Quillfish yeah. of the Queen City Quaxies. Now, you're already talking about it, so I'll give my two cents. Um, I remember the sec... When did we play last? We played week... Six. Okay, so in our rematch in week six, I remember I was U-turning a lot with Landorus, and yep. I was not paying attention to um, items. Like I, like yeah. I was kind of just because you know, if you watch my videos, I, I like to skip to the end of turn. I remember, it was like turn three, and my Landorus is already like fifty percent HP. I was like, how the fuck did this happen? I saw Rocky Helmet on Quillfish, and it's like. You look at a Pokemon like Quillfish, it's like, okay, you know what it's going to do, but it, it really does put on that kind of pressure, and for it being a tier 5 Mon, like, it really, like, again, some matchups, like, the first one that comes to mind is your match against B, like, you get up to hazards and the game is literally just over. Quillfish, right. definitely... Obviously not the best KD, but in a defensive Pokemon, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that utility, and if it can help the rest of your team prosper, and I think Quillfish definitely did that for your team this season. Oh, he did the job. He did the job for sure. Did the okay. job that I needed it to do. Uh, you got to take a PU pick, and I couldn't have been more happy with the outcome of mine, for sure. All right, so uh, before we move on to the next category, Queen City Quillfish next season, are you sticking with the Quacks, Lease? I got to go Queen City Quillfish. Oh, I'm going to draft over Quill. Um, oh, he said it here first, y'all. If you're I'm looking at over, Quill. if you're looking at it, Quill or over Quill, you might have to draft it earlier than this boy. But all right, move on to our next category here. We got Old best Mandy. duo. This is probably the most fun category in my opinion. We For had a, sure. we had a lot of interesting combos here. Nido King Wim, don't gotta explain that. Drill, T-Tar, Scizor, Politoed, Weather Duos, so again, don't really have to explain that, but I, uh, when I was thinking of the nominees to put on here, Guzzlord Slowbro, it's not an obvious one when you first look at it, but when the way that you're playing it this season, and the way that it worked, it just makes, just from a type synergistic way, from the Guzzlord and Slowbro's type combo alongside with just the Trick Room into the Teleport into a Life Orb or Banded Guzzlord at times. Guzzlord was e like, if he came in on that Trick Room, man, like, oh my. Like, I remember your first game against Tanner of the season. Guzzlord just wrecked. It was bad. It was. Wasn't it Banded Outrage or something? Yeah, then I got the five turn Outrage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. Oh my god. His Umbreon was struggling to breathe in there, bro. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I will say, you know, normally I'm a little biased. I will say there are some better duos than my Slowbro and Guzzlord. Um, obviously, you know, Guzzlord and Slowbro, they're doing one thing. You know what I mean? And yeah. you're going to switch out to exactly how you need to do. I mean, either you stall it out, either you stall out the Trick Rooms, or, you know, you go into your fairy type and you try to hold off Guzzlord for as long as you can. Um, obviously, I needed that pressure put on teams. It was there. My eyes are all over the Nitto King and Whimsicott from, from the Hartsville hit on top. Now, I would have to agree, but people were sleeping on... When I, I remember I first mentioned it was like week 6 or week 7. I mentioned Low Pony Victini is an evil duo. No one was understanding why. But folks, let me just explain this to you. Between Lopunny and Victini, they had 87 kills just between the two of them. No other duo in Big Juice is even close to that amount of kills in two Pokemon. These two Pokemon literally ran the league in kills. Like, Lopunny had second most kills in the league behind Mega Scizor, and it, it was a free agency move that Tabs made week three. So it was. Two, it was four games, two weeks behind Scizor, and it was only behind by eight kills. In my mind, that's nuts. And then Victini, had him last season, I'll always stand Victini, but you just, it's not an obvious, it, yeah, it's not, shut up, but it's not an obvious one at first, but when you look at it, in my eyes, I think it is the only duo on this list that is comparable to Nido King versus Wim. Now, you said Nito versus Wim is probably going to be the winner here, right? 
Well, he's, uh, I want to go in a little bit more, right? So with with Lopunny and Victini, I think the synergy for being a duo isn't there. You know what I mean? Like they're not playing off each other. I I, I think. Agree. I think for me, I mean, obviously, when you look at the screen, you're looking at Tyranitar and you're looking at Excadrill. Obviously, they do exactly what the other one needs, and Excadrill being the heavy glass cannon that Tyranitar comes in and builds with. Obviously, we're not talking about Politoed and Scizor at all, because... <laughs> okay, well, if we're talking about a type synergistically, Politoed and Scizor is that, you know? Yeah, right, like, right. I'm not... Preston, we're not hating on you, but... We think that you over... I was saying that all season long, you overestimated what Scissor could do in the rain. And I feel like that's why people are kind of sleeping on this duo compared to the others on this list. Um, right. The T-Tar and Drill, I think Wu had struggled pretty hard early to keep Drill alive, keeping it in in weird situations where we got one shot, but... Or switching it into moves that got one shot, but as the season went on, he definitely crafted the duo into what it should have been. But I, I would, uh, yeah, I would agree in what you said. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I just think in my eyes, Nidico and Whimsicott, how many games Chase won simply based on the fact that he could get that Whimsicott in one more time to get up a tailwind to set Nidico King up? Alright, well. Let's see, the best duo winner of Season 2, Nido King and Wim. Obviously... Yeah, I'm two for two. Yeah, obviously just... I feel like a lot of people kind of figured this. Uh, personally, for me, I, like, it's tough. Because the low punny and Victini, it's like you said, it's not... They're not synergistically there, but if we're talking about synergy, this these two are it. Because Chase was running Choice Scarf, Nido King at times, and I remember it was like week three or week four when he played Tanner, and I told him, I was like, why don't you just do Tailwind? And once I opened that third eye in him, he just, that was his bread and butter rest in the season, and he almost made playoffs because of it, just fell a little bit short, but I mean, these two Pokemon are easily going to be on everyone's eyes moving into next season, in my opinion. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. With with having the luxury of running that life orb on Nido King, with like having the cushion of your outs beating every single thing on his team and hitting it for at least ninety percent, is was definitely a huge factor. Yeah, you get rid of one. You get rid of Nido King's only weakness is that he's really slow, and he just he goes from being just a wall breaker to just being a wall breaker and the complete just six zero sweeper. So, Chase, you deserve this one. Unfortunately, you didn't make playoffs, but you got what you wanted. You got best duo. Now on to the next category, best nicknames. Now, this one, most people didn't even nickname their Pokemon most of the time, but I figured just do this one for the hell of it. JC, who do you think won this? Dude, I mean, you got to go with Chris. I mean, it was in and out. He had a different theme with every with with every team. He had a different theme. Okay. My, my best nickname was I just named it. Each coach sucks after yeah. every one of my mods. So I definitely got to go with Chris on this one. Yeah, I'm not going to spend much time on this one because I feel like everyone just knows. But obviously, best nickname goes to Chris. Man was, sure. uh, man was saucing with the nicknames this season. And uh, definitely um, had some interesting names. That, that's uh, how I'll put it. Hopefully, we can see what names he brings to these playoff matches. And we'll see what he names his Pokemon moving into next season. But, uh, yeah, we're not going to spend much time on this one for obvious reasons. But, yeah. All right. Now on to a better topic. Most improved coach. Now, in my opinion, not my opinion, but when you look at these coaches, right? Right. Like, Wu, first time ever playing competitive Pokemon. And he kind of came, like, Wu and B... They came out the gate swinging. Like, they... Obviously, they were new, but they didn't have, like, that learning curve that a lot of new players have. They kind of just came out and were just hitting from the get-go. Um, Preston and Chris, Season 1, came off some rough seasons. Preston was the only coach to not even get a win last season, and he spent a lot of the first half of this season without any wins. But Chase... 
he, I think he's a little bit more consistent than the rest. So in my opinion, um, I didn't really see him that he improved that. Not that he's a bad player, didn't improve at all, but I don't think his growth was as noticeable as some of the other ones. Um, right, right. So, so I'm gonna try to go down this list as fast as I can. In my eyes, you know, obviously, I think the most improved coach is is Chris, and that's 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 uh, who I would go with. Just because of last season, I look every time I went up against Chris, this is an easy win. Like this is a free win. Like I'm going up one more in my win column, and I'm 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 good on the day. This season, I mean, it was a completely different beast. I was going in, I was wondering like, is he gonna make this switch? Like, do I have to worry about him making this? If he does this, then I just lose. So for me, in my eyes, it's Chris. Now I get what you're saying about Chase, because um, I feel like Chase has always had that X factor in him. He's always willing to like take that risk to get the win, which normally pays off more times than not, especially in a league like ours, where we do have a bunch of newer players. Um, I do think Chase already had that X factor. Um, obviously, he did better than he did last season. I will say that. Um, obviously, the draft didn't go his way, so he was already you know, yeah, yeah. mental shock in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, hard hard to say with B because uh, obviously he came in late in the season and dude when he that first match against Tanner where he was I don't know if he meant to be predicting one of every Tanner's yeah, moves that's, that's what I'm saying like B just his his brain is built for Pokemon so he already right, said he's yeah. not going to be around for season 3 which I hate to see but hopefully in season 4 come around and come back because in my opinion B is the most. If he was already playing like how he was without even understanding Pokemon or how his he wants to play the game, give him a season or two and RDL. He's gonna be, in my opinion, he's like a he's a he's a major playoff contender if he decides to ever come back. In my eyes. Right. Yeah. No. I I agree with you. I definitely think he has like the mindset to understand what's going on and what he needs to do to win. Um, uh, moving on to Preston, it's hard for me with Preston because Preston gets something and he runs with it. It's, it's the whole season. He's trying to get that one thing out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it like, and this season it worked. It was swords, dance, scissor, mega scissor. Obviously. I mean, you're, you're two shot and if not one shotting every mon on the field, with with Mega Scizor. And honestly, I think it's crazy because Preston does have like he drafted very well. He understood what he needed to do. I just think he gets too locked in on this is the only way I can win. I and to, I I hope he changed that. I would have to agree. Um again he went 0 and six last season and then this season he was like 0 and four, 0 and five or something. And then it was around that mid season, like week three, week four to like week six or seven. That's where Scissor and him just ramped up all these kills, went on a great mid season run. I got cut short towards the end of the season because he went on vacation and couldn't play his last couple games. He had to forfeit and he couldn't make playoffs because of that. But I think. In my mind, when I think of most improved coaches, I'm looking at Preston and Chris. I think both of their growths this season compared to last season was a lot more. Right. And, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's hard for me with Wu too, because obviously I haven't seen Wu play that often. Um, but I mean, honestly, I think Wu was pretty sound coming out the gate. So I, I don't, I don't see why. Um, I'd have to think of him as improved. I thought he was pretty good coming out. Yeah, when I did this, I kind of just put, at the time, the bottom five coaches on most improved, and then at, at the time, the most for coach of the season, I put the top five. Obviously, Chris, he took fifth seed over tabs the last second, so it kind of fucked this whole thing up. But again, um, now moving on to who actually won. It's Chris. Uh, Chris. I, yeah, I feel like we all kind of figured it. Uh, I mean, just, he really started to learn the game, get comfortable with his team. He really relied heavy on Charizard X early in the season, and then around the midseason when everyone figured him out, he kind of went on this, like, weird hiatus of just, like, not being able to win. And right. late game, late into the season, when playoffs are on the line, 
He figured out another win con in Crest. He figured out how to use some of his other Pokemon. Dropped the Ludicolo and the Carbing for that Gastrodon and Shinotic like we mentioned earlier. Managed to get into that playing tournament and then secured fifth seed. Literally a zero to hero journey in Chris. Right. Um, it, I feel like this is pretty hands down in my opinion. Yeah, that's all That's all I got to say. I mean, you went from being a bottom two team last season to contending for a chip. So, I mean, you got to give it to him. 100% respect earned, Chris. You deserved it. Looking to see how you fare against Amnaz and potentially JC himself if you make it out of that quarterfinals. It's going to be a rough game for you, my man. <laughs> All right, moving on. Now, there's a lot of Pokemon here, yeah. but it, this was probably the most uh, contested category. Number one, because there's a lot of Pokemon, but number two, just a lot of... Every, Every a lot of the Pokemon on here, uh, except Lantern, uh, a lot of the Pokemon on here really just held their weight, in my opinion. Dude, I mean, I have to agree. Obviously, I have two up here with Chansey and Slowbro. Um, I gotta back up my boy Tanner a little bit and say, with his team, it was well rounded with Lantern being on it. Um, I will it say he played Lantern well. I see what you're saying. Right. I see what you're right. I think I think Tanner has very good understanding that he can't just run every bit of offense, and Lantern was that guy for him. And I know that was hard for him to swallow, not picking up a, per, a mon that could two shot something. So. Yeah. I, yeah. Um. And you have two on here, but so does another coach in Taboon. He has his Blissey and Dustclops here. And when I was first making this category. I was like, okay, well, we need Slowbro Chansey, and we need Blissey to, uh, Clops. So then I was thinking, okay, well, that's four, and I only want about, like, five at most. So I was debating between Weezing and Bronzong, and then I put Weezing on. And when I showed the categories to everyone, uh, a couple people were mentioned, Tanner mentioned Lantern, uh, people brought up arguments for Bronzong. So it really just ballooned into an eight-mon category, which I had no intention to, but... When you look at the, like, Chansey Slowbro was a disgusting core all season, and Klopp's Blissey was all, like, I, I, if it would have felt not right having them both on here, obviously I probably could have cut one of the two out, but I felt like it kind of and needed he traded it. Blissey. He, he traded did. Blissey. He traded it last week for playoffs, so now he has a Moongus instead, so Blissey, no longer a member, but... Which is crazy. It's crazy to me. Yeah, I, I mean, may, may he, I guess he prioritizes that 100% sleep chance more than just being essentially immune to special attacks. That's probably, what it, I don't know. I guess you got, I mean, I think against Tanner, which is his first round playoff opponent, I think Blissey would have been very key to success there. But I, I would I'm have to agree. Do, do you, my man. I will, I will, I will. I will defend him in one situation. <laughs> He made the trade while he was still in fifth seed for playoffs. So he made that trade anticipating he was playing against Emnez, but a poor performance towards the end of the season in the play-on tournament meant that he fell to the sixth seed. So I will defend him in that regard. Okay. All right, fair enough. And I'm, I'm going to give you your props here with Mega Autono. Um, obviously, Mega Autono being your Pokemon, this is the first bond you've had in a category. Um, no, I had Kecleon. Or besides Kecleon, yeah, 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 yeah. But that was not even close to winning that. Yeah, no. But, <laughs> <laughs> no. dude, you had people prepping. And I'm telling you, when people, because obviously when they can't come to you, they come to me and they say, hey, like, you know, <laughs> what What can I do to, like, what can I, do? What, like, look over my team. You know, obviously I didn't, you help these coaches out a lot. I, I tried, I don't have that kind of, like, dedication. I don't know. I don't have the time, the mental capacity yeah, to help yeah. myself and other people um but my god you have people prepping like holy shit how do i kill this like do i have to like i had tabs he wanted to block with blissey yeah yeah <laughs> toxic the automo <laughs> come on man yeah we had a there are some interesting things that i saw this season to counter my auto um 
One of them being, uh, the only time someone brought Taunt against Audino was Tanner, and coincidentally that was one of the games I lost. Uh, go figure, but, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna hype up Audino, I mean, Audino, I, listen, it's the lowest tier mega possible, but I feel like it provided a lot for my team, um, obviously not a Pokemon you can bring to every game, but I feel like the games that it did come, its impact was definitely shown, but... Um, in my eyes, um, I think it was notable for a nomination, but I don't, I, I didn't even vote for Audino myself. I, I don't, yeah, no, I didn't. Um, right. but if we're talking about who do you think is a defensive MVP, you can be biased, you can be honest, however you want. Oh. Who do you think is walking home with, walking home with this? Oh my god, this is such a tough one, because I don't, don't want to keep voting my moms, you know what I mean? Alright, uh, so um, let's exclude Chain C and Slubra then. Looking at the rest, okay. who do Fair you enough. think walked home Fair with enough. it? I gotta go with... I gotta go with Dusclops, I guess. Um, obviously, Dusclops being the threat of... Obviously, you have Nightshade, Will-O-Wisp, Pain Split, like, knock off. It's just, it's disrupting more than you want it to, while still being a wall at the same time. So, I mean, I gotta go with Dusclops. It's only weakness is knockoff. I mean, because you knock it off super effective and get rid of a TV light, which sucks. But, other than that, there's no real way of hitting that mod. Yeah, and that, yeah. Um, in my opinion, it was kind of like a three-way tie for me. I, 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 I agree with what you said in Dusclops, but I also feel like... To not mention Bronzong or Weezing. Bronzong as a wall? Let, let me just... Okay, I know it was something stupid. Bronzong as a wall ended up with a 21 to 25 KD. That's absolutely nuts for a fucking wall. Um, and then Weezing. Once Wu made that trade, it really just made his team so much more um, cohesive together. And once he dropped the Reggie Seal for Weezing... I know I had a lot of people asking me, like, how the fuck am I going to kill this thing? And it's like, it's hard. If you don't hit it specially and you keep hitting it on the physical side, like, you're not going to kill it. It's going to will a spew. It's going to pain split. It's going to be annoying. But that out of the way. Oh, you got something to say? Yeah. I mean, I, I have to agree with you, but I got to go back to the way that coaches played their mods. And That's I fair. think Woo... And more times than not, we were getting frustrated in the call, me and you, of him letting that Mon get too low or letting it just die. And I think that kind of deters my decision away. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, for defensive MVP of Big Juice Season 2, the Let's go, dude. Five of for the five. Bambinos. Now, I, again, I, I have to agree with everything you said. Um, obviously, it's only weakness being knockoff, and obviously, some people look at that as too big to draft. But all ghosts are weak to knockoff, and even when you knock this thing's you have a violate off, it still has like base 150 defenses. So it, it's still, even without a violate, it is still extremely bulky, extremely annoying. Um, in my opinion, more than well deserved for Tabs, uh, especially since he didn't win the best duo with Victini and Lopunny. I feel right. like I feel like this is a a way of just getting some confidence in him again for his playoffs and maybe in the next season. Yeah, I can't I can't win every category I'm in, so I get <laughs> that you guys wanted to go with Dust Clops. I get it. I yeah, get it. yeah, yeah. All right, now. Now this is a little bit more of a fun. Now this is where it's getting a little exciting. It's all megas now. except for Nido King. <laughs> it's all megas except for Nido King and Dragapult. Now, oh my God. this is this here is a little crazy because you have Nido King who already won best duo, which is and we already talked about Nido King earlier, so we can kind of skip that. Low punny as well. Scissor we kind of already talked about, but. Talk, talk to us about Pinsir, man, because you had a great season with the boy. Uh, okay, so Pinsir, for me, 
Um, obviously, I don't think he should win this category, oddly enough. I, I don't think he should win this category. For me, Pinsir was more of cleanup and just just obviously putting on that pressure because a lot of times I would hard swap him in and out because I knew what was coming out before him. And, you know, I had a lot of people running like Rock Slide and shit like that. Bro. I had people running Rock Slide instead of Stone Edge because they didn't want to take a chance to miss Pinsir and get swept. So but for me, that pressure alone, kind of, you know what I mean? I feel like I, I agree with what you're saying, but at the same time, that pressure that it puts on, can't really discredit that. Yeah, no, I, I can't. I can't. It definitely, he's definitely saved me a few games. I mean, there's been a point where I'm looking at, okay, the rest of his mods at 45% HP. I'm wiping out the rest of his team. I, I've been there before, and I definitely got to thank Pinscher for that. And also, like, him being as offensive as he is and having that speed definitely put my team where it needed to be for playoffs. Yeah, uh, 100%. Um, I mean, you didn't... The one game that you and Tabs had, we didn't get the replays for, unfortunately. And then your last week against MNAS, you guys just didn't even play. And Pinscher still ended up with 39 kills. I mean, if we had those two games played... Pincer could have potentially had second or even first place and ever taken scissor and kills it its presence was very strong and it's like you said it just forces you to bring stealth rocks and to have like three pokemon with rock slide because if Pincer comes in late game and all your pokemon are weakened it just cleans up and another pokemon that does that really well is megalakazam a pokemon that's been drafted both seasons and by both coaches that it's been used by in both seasons, it's just, in my opinion, Alakazam is one of, if not, uh, not the most, but one of the most consistent Megas in draft. Just, it forces your opponent to bring Sucker Punch and just bring Choice Scarfers that they don't want to bring. Like, I feel like MNES had a very good showing on Alakazam this season. For sure. I can I can definitely agree with that. I mean, you got to worry about, like, you're almost having to sack Mons because if you let this thing get up a substitute, you're losing the game. And you had to let go of Mons just in case he did that. Otherwise, he'd just use Psychic and you're dead anyway. So I definitely feel like it's, its offense is definitely unmatched on the special side for sure. Yeah. And then, obviously, Dragapult, um, I feel like, personally, me... This might just be a little biased on my end because I was the one using it, not playing against it. But I feel like Dragapult. I almost didn't put. I, at first, I didn't. I put Blacephalon on here, but a couple people were mentioning that Dragapult should be on here instead of Blacephalon, so I made the change. But Dragapult. Again, I might be a little biased since I wasn't on the other end, but I feel like Dragapult. I'm not gonna say it didn't do its job. It it went. It was very well, and I remember. He, <laughs> The first game we played. Ah, don't bring it up, bro. <laughs> don't bring up the Phantom Force tech, bro. This, Get that bro, shit sub, out of here. Substitute Phantom Force pull. But I don't care how the I don't care if I win the chip or not this season. The fact that I got that set to work. That that's shit all I needed. To, that's that all I needed gross. to see. <laughs> that shit is gross. My man's over here. You turn Volt Switching, substitute Phantom Force. I can't hit him with Future Sights, can't hit it with anything, bro. Well, the fact that you can't hit a sub, it's a substitute. Why is it disappearing with you, bro? That shit. Oh my god, that drives me to the wall still. <laughs> oh man. Alright, so <laughs> memes is out the way. Um, we already saw Nido King walk away with one award this, this night. Do you think he's walking away with this award, or who do you think he's going to? I think I'd be ignorant not to go with Scizor. And in my eyes, I mean, it literally won. It was 6-0 in teams with one Swords Dance. I mean, I just I can't look away from the fact that, regardless of how I think Preston should have played it or not, and also Mega Scizor being my Season 1 champion, I can't, I can't go against Mega Scizor in this category. Yeah, and... Um... Yeah, Scizor just, again, we talk about, we've expressed some negativity on it tonight so far and how he overestimated it, but in the times that Preston used it correctly, it actually just felt unstoppable. I remember Tanner, I remember specifically Tanner's game against Scizor, 
and he had Fire Fang on Reggie Drago, and when this rain was up, it was only doing like 20%. Like, it was abs- It was absolutely- Like, he would he set up while he was getting Fire Fang, and just 6 or tanners. Yeah. It was- Scizor was kill leader for a reason, and will that translate to an offensive MVP award? Yes, it will. Yes, yes it, it will. will. Oh my god, I'm 6 for 6 over here, bro. Holy shit, I'm on fire. That's what I'm saying, man. You got that third eye in your brain, but speak a little more on it. Scizor just dropped how many? Like, let me get the final number. It dropped 55 kills to end the season, um, and that's without even playing in the last two games of the season. It easily could have reached 60, 70 plus. Um, Scizor just one season, one for a reason. Preston even stole your duo in Gujar Scizor. Um, yep, yep, how are you feeling yep, about that, yep. seeing that being used against you this season? I mean, it's flattering. I got to <laughs> say, I'm flattered. I'm flattered somebody's trying to copy my swag and my style. Um, it just didn't work. It didn't work for him, you know what I mean? And it, it, well, the way he used Gudra, God, upsets me. But he definitely put Mega Scizor in the spotlight, and that I can get behind. I mean, you, you just can't. But so I, Honestly, this thing's a wall inside of a wall breaker on the defensive side. So, I, I mean, I can't turn a blind eye to that. Yeah, when I look at top Megas in Draft League, I think of two immediately. Mega Altaria and Mega Scizor. They, they are the only two Megas that can fill, like, three or more roles on a team and be probably top of the line at all three at the same time. And again, yeah. Preston... He brought some defogs at some times, but the one that he was most comfortable with and was performing the best on was just that Swords Dance Bullet Punch. And it's very plug and play, but he knew his opportunities to do it. And when he got that opportune time in, games were just ended like within five turns. It, it was very, very threatening. Yeah, 100%. Got to give it the offensive MVP. I think Preston did a good job. I would have to agree. Now, this is... Probably, I like to save the two biggest for last. This is MV. We're talking now the difference between defensive and offensive MVP, and then with MVPs. When you think of MVP, you think of a Pokemon that was so essential to their team that without that Pokemon, their team kind of just doesn't function the same. Like, their team just. It just doesn't work without them. Again, Nido King. We've talked about it all night. We're going to talk about it again. Yeah. There's a reason he's been nominated for almost every category. Nido King just... You can't... It came in week three as a trade. He dropped Swampert for it. And it is... It cannot be understated the amount of pressure that Nido King put on throughout the entire league. No, it can't. It can't. I mean, even if you're not running the tail, when you got to worry about the damn choice scarf. So, uh, I, I think uh, with... Not, the draft not going in Chase's favor. He had to go back to all reliable and Nido King, and it worked out because that thing is a force to be reckoned with for sure. Yeah, and I think he already mentioned that he's going to franchise it. So for everyone in the league, if Chase does decide to franchise it moving into next season, got to wait till season four for it to at least be on the draft table. Um, Mega Scizor yeah, just won offensive MVP. There's a reason why it's on here too. Kill leader, offensive MVP, just an ab season one champion. Says Mega Scizor is probably the most illustrious Pokemon in Big Juice so far. I mean, just on your team and on Preston's team, it's just the pressure it puts on from, like you said, defensive and offensively. It's just so hard to prep against, and especially when you pair it with that rain, it's it it makes it too it makes it overwhelming at times right i mean i can't i can't vote for him on mvp because after he took that fire blast from my slow bro and absolutely ate the dirt um i i, I just I, I can't see it as an mvp if it's not on my team it's not the overall mvp it can be the offensive mvp all at once but i can't give it the overall all right so you talk to me about pincer then do you think pincer deserves the mvp um i think he's a close second I, I think he's a close second behind uh, the Zard. I think he, he's behind the Zard. All right, so let's, talk um, the Zard then. let's talk about the Zard then, because we already talked about your pins in the last category. But yeah, you you, t you talk to me first about the Zard, because you think that deserves it. Tell me about the Zard. 
the coverage, the typing, the the overall, the D dance. You get one up, you're winning the game. I mean, it's just it's it's a crazy mod. I mean, obviously it gets you know chalked by Stealth Rocks at times, but I mean, I think he played around it well. I honestly don't think people brought Stealth Rocks as much as they should against Chris, but that's neither here or there. Um, I mean, I think it really capped out his team into where Chris, after, you know, halfway through the season, he didn't feel like, okay, I can only pin it on Charizard, but it was still there as a backup plan and got to be one of the best backup plans I've ever seen. Yeah, when you transition your plan from, like, week one through three and being have Charizard win to, like, end of the season, like, week seven through nine to Charizard is there, but we're going to work with some other things. That's when you can see the growth, and that's why Chris deserved and won uh, Most Improved Coach. Um, Chris, Chris's season, like, when I think of Chris as a player, I think of Charizard X. Like, it is as... It is as, like, on the nose as Chris is as a person. It's just... And he used it super well. I mean, I would have to agree with you. I think... I kind of agree that with this category, in my opinion... Like, the defensive one had, like, the most, like, Pokemon in the category. But I think this one is probably the hardest for me to choose from. Because... Right. Scizor, so essential to Preston's team. Nido King was literally Chase's entire team, it felt like, at times. Charizard was just... If you, you have to worry about a Cresselia. You have to worry about every... You have to worry about what the Reggie... Right, to, sapping Shenotic. Yeah, you have to worry about Shenotic. I literally lost because of Shenotic. Like, it's just Chris's team was very good, and Charizard was just the designated just glued with all. When you have a team as threatening as yeah. Chris's, and then you just put on a Pokemon like Charizard X, it just makes it so much more. And 100%. He was, uh, he was the cleanup hitter. He was in the four hole, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. And moving on to the last one on the list, we have Landers. Um, I put it on here because I dropped Corviknight for Landers moving into week three. And I brought it to every single game possible after that um landorus it, it's the king of ou and i believe it is also the king of draft um ground flying is such a great typing intimidate is such an op ability i brought it defensive more times than not uh but even offensively like landorus in general is just a super like it is one of those pokemon where you can literally bring it to every game because one, it's gonna force HP ices and ice shards. For no it's like Pinsir. It's gonna force the rock, like Pinsir with rock moves. It's gonna force you to bring ice moves just to kill this thing. Um, and it, it, like I said, I've been bringing it defensive more times than not. And it was behind Dragapult by one. It ended the season with 37 kills, and it came in two weeks. It came in four games after Dragapult. So, Landorus. Um, maybe not as noticeable as the other four on this list, but I felt like it was, as, like I said earlier in the offensive MVP category, Dragapult, maybe I was a little biased against it because I was the one using it, but I am biased for Landorus because just, I could see it from my end, like just how much work it was putting in. So, it's... I mean, I do, th I do wish I would have been able to see you run more offensive, maybe like, you know, a rock polish here, a sword stance here. I do wish I would have seen you sweep a little bit with it because all that's replaying in my head is you just told me the king of the draft, the king of OU was getting scared out by a quillfish every time he came on the field. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I don't need to hear this you goddamn thing. If I, if I clicked Earthquake... No, hey, listen, man. I was it, living, it, and it, you were taking 70. It w uh, You know what? All right. You know what? You said Charizard's one in this category, right? I did. I did. I did. All right. Let's see if Charizard is walking home with MVP. Winner of MVP of Big Juice Championship League Season 2 is Nidoking. Walking home with Three a... Categories. 
walking home with two category wins. Now, again, like we were mentioning earlier, Nido King just pressure it. P I'm almost beat. Like, it cannot. <laughs> Chase's team pre week three was just. I honestly thought Chase was going to be the worst team in the league because he was not just not having it. The second he picked up Nido King, his whole season just turned around like that. Like, immediately just, you could see the growth. It, it was insane. Yeah, uh, no, I 100% I agree. Uh, um, he had to go back to his roots with that, his, his uh, season one pick, and he ran with it, and it did exactly what he needed it to do, and it brought him back. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean... Is, he got nominated for like what three or four categories and walked home with two out of them. Like, if if this isn't showing it, like, Nito King. Yeah, moving into season four, even next season, just pick up Nito Queen if Chase decides to actually franchise this because the Nitos are just so threatening and just there's a reason Nito King is picking up all these goddamn categories because it, it's just fucking absurd. All sure, right. for sure, I agree. Moving into our last category of the award show, we have Coach of the Season. Um, talk to us about all the other ones besides yourself, and then I'll talk about you at the end. Okay, so I mean, with Tanner, obviously, um, he's very transparent in what he wants to do. It's gonna be hyper offense. It's gonna be in your face. It's gonna be I want to I want to hit you for seventy percent every time you bring him on the field. And I can't lie to you, it works. It fits Tanner's play style. It fits exactly how he wants to get things done, and it works. He is very successful when it comes to um, making those predictions. Sometimes where he needs to take away him on out of the game, and he has that ability with the team he has. Um, I definitely think he's a solid drafter. Obviously, I would like to see him go a little bit more defensive into the next season a little bit more calculated but overall i think tanner is a fantastic coach and he was a, a threat to anyone and everyone yeah i mean you look at his team i mean last season i was like okay there's no way he could get like he had galarian zap those he had what was his mega last season i i forget it. let me scroll down uh, a bit. i don't know it was houndoom yeah, Mega, he had. Yeah, I was like, "There's no way he gets more offensive than this." And then he drafts Mega Glead, Bocephalon, redrafts Nihilego, just. Yep. Runs it, Rock Polish Torterra and. <laughs> yeah, he even had. He didn't bring Minior to like any game after like week two, except for like one game against Chase. But his team was just hyper, and it's like you said, he it's very aggressive from, like literally turn one is just so like, intent games against. Oh, it's Tanner, in your face. Yeah, literally, even if you get the lead wrong against Tanner, that can be, like, game-ending. So, definitely Tanner, a coach that is very open about how he wants to play the game, but he performs the best by doing so, and I, there's a reason why he went to the championship last season and why he made playoffs again. Definitely, definitely interested to see how playoffs turns out for him. Now, Tabs... Yeah. Um, Tabs is a uh, Tabs had a weird season. He came out the gate strong. He lost some games here and there, and then towards the end of the season, he started struggling a bit. As, but I think overall, coming in as a new coach, um, first time doing draft, I, I forget ever or just in a while. But Tabs, a solid season for sure. Um, but not someone I would personally vote for for coach of the season. I mean, yeah, if if you're looking at tabs for those reasons, MNAS is just a better version. And I hate <laughs> and I hate to say that. I hate to say it. I mean, but I've been saying it all season, but MNAS is Mr. Consistent. Right. I think at the gate, uh, with the new people coming on board, obviously I only thought, you know, it was me, Tanner, and Plaz. It's going to be top three. It's who I'm going to have to worry about. Everything else is a lock. And for the most part, it was. But I got to say... Mnaz definitely pleasantly surprised me with his his play style and his knowledge of what's going on and his ability to understand I need to keep this mono alive to win this game. Whether or not he gets me a kill right here, he can still win the game. So he definitely pleasantly surprised me in the way that um, he could definitely beat any one of us on any given match. And uh, I love that shit. 
Yeah, I mean, the one match that I always go back to when I think Mnaz, it was his game, like, week 8 or week 9 against Wu. Um, he was in a very bad situation, but he knew that Alakazam was the win con, and he managed to kill the T-Tar, get rid of the sand, and he got the chip damage he needed. He sacked, like, one, I forget who he sacked, but he sacked something, brought in Alakazam, quick side shock like, four or five times, and won the game just because he understood that Alakazam just needs that chip off, and then he wins the game. He's a very smart player, very consistent player, and I know I had, I, you might disagree, but there's a reason I have him going to finals. I, I know it's a tall task for him to defeat you, but I think if there is anyone to do the job, I think Mnaz is definitely the person to do it. He made some last minute trades, and I think it becomes a lot of an interesting matchup in your game versus him. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think his trades are counterproductive with the terrains, but we'll, I mean, we'll see. We'll see um, exactly how he goes about prepping for my team. Obviously, if he brings the same thing, it's not going to work. Um, I think I honestly think in that set he'll win the first game, and then I'm going to win the back two off of just simply adapting to exactly how he wants to play the game. But. We'll see. Um, I can't let my boy Tabs go out the way I let him go out with Inez being the better version. Tabs, I feel like, is... <laughs> I gotta redeem myself a little yeah. bit, and I can't. I can't be beating <laughs> these guys up. Um, Tabs, to me, has a very similar play style to me, where he has, um, like, you know, half offense, half defense, and he can switch those up in any time he wants, but he's very consistent on how he builds his team. And um, that, that's something I appreciate. I just think he needs to learn more of when to take those risks, when to click the move that's going to hurt them on coming in, or when he needs to hard swap out and, you know, have a better matchup to gain momentum. And I just think that's what he needs to work on. Yeah, I think I, I would have to agree for the most part with what you said. Um, Tabs definitely has moments where he makes, I think it was a set against Tanner, uh, game one, Tanner showed that he had like a Dragon Dance, Focus Sash, Dual Wing Beat set for his Bombay lead, which is a very good prep. But game two, Tanner led the, they, they led the same Pokemon, and he just let his Bombay die for. I, it was a very like plays like that. Tabs and make it times, and it's just head scratching. But besides those like few plays that he made, um, I would have to agree. Tabs just. There's a reason why you and him were the only coaches that have two Pokemon for defensive MVP. You guys like to draft your bulk. You guys also like to draft your heavy hitters. Uh, I, I I didn't really think about it until you just mentioned it, but yeah, you and Tabs definitely have similar play styles. And I think it's a play style that definitely works the best in draft. And speaking sure. of yourself, um, Season 1 champ. Uh, best record coming out of the regular season, just secured number one seed. I mean, JC is uh, like, I know I had MS beating him in the playoffs, but I mean, when you really think about it, like, JC is the man to beat. And Big Juice, I mean, he's, lo he's looking at making the repeat win, and if he does, he's going to piss a lot of people off. But I mean, <laughs> at the moment, I mean, it it's hard. It's truly hard to bet against the man that's looking to do a repeat of winning back-to-back -back chips it's just i don't know how you bet against him at this moment yeah, especially since you rated my draft like second of last last season uh it was like ninth on the list so i appreciate that it gave me the motivation i need to overcome my obstacles yeah you're welcome you're welcome and then put myself on here i secure number two seed uh, i got it i got it let me talk it. about okay. you man let me talk about you. Plaz is always a scary matchup. It's always a scary matchup because he does have a lot of sneaky sets. He has a lot of... His prep is very good in terms of... If I take this mod out of the equation, I'm going to win the game. And uh, that that works well for Plaz. I, I often consider him like the grandfather of the league where you know he's, he teaches everyone. And sometimes the student has to beat the teacher. And it's definitely been a hard challenge for some of these guys to overcome. Uh, for me, it's always scary. I mean, I had to literally pray and beg and plead that he wouldn't click Earthquake on his Landorus on my Quillfish. So, 
Yeah, you know, sometimes your boy likes to over predict a lot because that's just what we do on these streets, but you know, sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. Boy, if I see you in finals, JC, I'm just saying, you ain't getting back to back. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Damn. Damn. Right. We're going to feel the cool fish again. <laughs> oh, yeah? Is that what's going to happen? All right, now to end off the night with coach of the season, you went through all the other awards. To end off the night, coach of the season. Oh shit, belongs to JC. I mean, it's like I said, just simply the man to beat at the moment. Uh, secure number one seed again, or no? Last season you were number three seed coming into playoffs, but this season you secured number one. I mean had a better season than last season which is hard to even believe but um yeah just it's like i said if the, in in a lot of leagues it's hard for teams to win back to back because teams learn how they play and what they like to do like whether it's the nfl or esports or whatever but um i mean in, in big juice i mean it's it's like I said, just simply the man to beat at the moment. So we'll have to see if anyone can do it. I mean, I, I appreciate the high praise. Um, but in the two matches that I've lost this season, they have been absolute blowouts on me getting absolutely pummeled. It really just comes down to prep. Um, I'm honestly terrified of playoffs. I'm terrified to go against MNAS. I'm terrified to go against you or Tanner. Um, first of all, I love the picture that you have in here. I'm a yeah, big yeah, fan of I, that picture. Uh, I saw your Discord profile picture, and I was like, do I ask him for it? But I was like, ah, that might give away what award he might have won. So I was like, fuck it, I'll just go with another dog in a hoodie. <laughs> I was like... I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan <laughs> of that pic right there. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see how the season concludes, man, and I'm excited to get the draft started next season. Yeah, Scarlet and Violet, a lot of changes coming. But for the award show... We'll scroll through all the awards again very quickly. Underrated Pokemon goes to Quillfish and JC. Oh, 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 oh. Best duo goes to Nido King and the Wimmy of Chase and the Hartsville Hitmon Tops. Best nicknamer and most improved coach goes to your boy Chris of the Arizona Ass Ketchums. Defensive MVP goes to Dusclops of the Tabussi. Offensive MVP. Mega Scizor, really no surprise to anyone there, kill leader for a reason. Overall, MVP of the league goes to Nido King, and then coach of the season, like we were just talking about, JC of the Queen City, Wolffishes as of next season. Let's go, a lot of diversity in here, I'm excited, man. I'm oh, yeah. excited to get this season wrapped. Yeah, this season will be the first full season, so whenever this, whoever wins, whether it's me or JC, because I ain't having it any other way. Um, it's gonna be a, uh, it's gonna be last season a little bit controversial in the playoffs because you could only bring one team and all that shit. So this season, there's none of that <laughs> bullshit, none of that nonsense, no excuses, no excuses. If you lose in playoffs, you simply just got diffed. That's all there is to it. 100%, 100%, and I can't wait to diff some of y'all, man. All right, well, that's going to be me it for me and JC tonight. Hope you guys enjoyed. Later.